of you. Um, so you all should have just gotten that uh, notification that it'll be recorded. So just uh, click, got it. Um, so welcome to our session today called Compassionate Responses, utilizing calling in to address challenging comments. My name is Mac Kreit. It's the name on the left there. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a teaching and learning specialist here at CTRL, and I'll let my co-presenter introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Shed, like the thing in your backyard. I go by she or they pronouns, and I'm also a teaching and learning specialist here. Great. So before we get started, um, if you've been in any of our workshops before, you've likely seen this slide before. Um, but what we like to do is share some guidelines for participation. Um, we tend to do this before all of our workshops, and we would also, in sort of a meta moment, encourage you to do uh, something like this, some sort of collaborative norm setting with your students, especially if you're going to be having um, uh, discussions or conversations in class. It can be really helpful to set those guidelines at the very beginning of the semester um, in collaboration with students so that everyone is setting up these guidelines so they know what how they to participate, how they're supposed to conduct themselves in class, and also so that they have a little bit of agency over what those guidelines are. So throughout this workshop, we ask that you make yourself comfortable. Hopefully you're doing that already um, since you, we are virtual. So feel free to stim, rock, fidget, knit or craft, whatever you need to do to make yourself feel comfortable and engaged in the session. We'll ask that you be present and participate in individual and group activities in a way that works for you. We do intentionally incorporate research-based practices into our workshops. So this does include asking you to reflect and contribute at times and occasionally work with your peers. Um, so we just ask that you're present in that way that works for you. We'll invite you to ask questions and share ideas in the chat. Use the raised hand function if you would like to speak, and you can find that under the reactions panel on your uh, Zoom toolbar. And then finally, be generous with your knowledge and respectful of others' knowledge. And before we get into the content of the session today, um, we'd like to share a brief content warning. So the goal of our, and hopefully other content warnings, is to not have people opt out of a conversation but instead it's so that people can opt in and prepare themselves for the upcoming discussion. It can be rather jarring to hear or read something that's quite offensive and it just feels a little bit out of the blue. So we kind of wanted to let you know what you're in for in this session so you can prepare yourself and take the time um, and the space that you need to be comfortable. So our content warning then is during this session, we will discuss student comments, which may include harmful and microaggressive messages. These can include ideas which are racist, homophobic, transphobic, ableist, and sexist, among others. Uh, we will contextualize each instance of this language to illustrate how calling in can help you mediate these moments, but we do invite you to take breaks as necessary for your own well-being, so feel free to turn your camera off, step away from the computer, whatever you need to do to keep yourself uh, comfortable and safe in this space. So what we're going to do first, actually, is uh, get some of your ideas. So um, what we want to do is start with an opening poll to um, figure out what some of your concerns are related to addressing these challenging comments. So our poll question is, when addressing challenging student comments, which, if any, of these outcomes are you concerned about? And I'll note if your concerns are not addressed by this poll. Um, oh, and uh, Shed, did you launch it? OK, great. So uh, Shed just launched that poll. Um, and if your concerns aren't uh, addressed, feel free to share it uh, in the chat if you want to be uh, not anonymous or privately uh, via DMing either me or Shed if that works better for you. So I'll give you a sec to read over that question and the answers and start responding. For those of you that just uh, popped in, we're in the middle of answering a poll. Uh, it should have popped up on your screen, but if you can't see it, um, just message us and let one of us know. Give folks another few seconds to answer. Excellent. All right. I think we have a hundred percent participation rate, which is exciting. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Hopefully you should be able to see them on your screen. Yeah. So it looks like we have a variety of concerns, uh, which we expected, you know, that's why you come to a workshop like this to help get uh, support around some of the concerns that you may have. So I'm seeing uh, the majority of folks feel that they're that are worried about saying or doing something that makes the situation worse. And I think that's a really fair um, 
a really common, I mean, clearly it's a very common concern um, and it's something that we'll, we'll address today. So we'll talk you through some various strategies that you can use and you can choose from different strategies so that you can pick one that you think works best in the situation and recognize also that sometimes you do make mistakes and it's okay. And it's uh, about owning up to and recognizing those mistakes and even calling yourself in to address any of those mistakes or mis missteps that you might make. These conversations are really hard. It's very difficult to do this. Um, and so it, it's okay that we make mistakes. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing that poll now. And then we're gonna go um, into our workshop outcomes. So to address those concerns, hopefully by the end of this workshop, uh, you'll be able to distinguish calling in from calling out as strategies for approaching classroom comments. You'll be able to select some strategies for hand, handling disruptive comments before, during, and after class conversations occur. And then finally, we'll talk about the importance of calling in and reflecting on your own actions and potential missteps as an instructor. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Shed to talk about belonging and responding. All right, so let's look at some research about belonging and why responding to problematic or offensive comments is so important. Student belonging is tied to better student academic performance, which often is conflated with grades, um, but it also is tied to in better engagement and motivation to learn. So we know that students have to feel a sense of belonging to feel like they can really expand and grow and be challenged in our classes. But we also know that minoritized students experience significantly lower levels of belonging across dimensions of socioeconomic status, race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, immigrant status, religion, and I'm sure, as you can guess, many other qualities as well. So we know that our research is showing us that belonging is important, but that there are many groups of students who do not feel a sense of belonging or a decreased sense of belonging. And a major factor in belonging is a respectful classroom environment, of course, which interrupts problematic statements about positionality and those little moments can add up. So if a student continues to say hurtful things about my identity in class and it's not being intervened on, then I get the message that it's okay, right? And I feel less of a sense of belonging because the instructor is not um, doing anything to interrupt that sort of violent moment. And so um, right over time, this is this helps us under understand why marginalized students tend to feel that lower level of belonging, and finally, not addressing and or deflecting problematic statements in class can affirm biased beliefs and legitimize problematic statements. That's from Daryl Dwight and Sue, who you may have heard of, uh, did really incredible pioneering work on microaggressions. And so what Sue is pointing out in this study is that ignoring the comments and or saying, oh, that's not relevant, or we'll talk about that later, or let's not think about that let's just get started. Those sorts of ways of addressing those statements can leave students feeling, like I said, like they don't belong, like they're not welcome in that space, and that the instructor thinks it's okay for them to receive targeted, hurtful, offensive comments. And it can even legitimize those comments in the eyes of the student. So what do we want to do about this? Well, we want to suggest a strategy called calling in, which you may have heard of before. So when we're distinguishing between calling out versus calling in, I'm sure we're all familiar with calling out um, in some way. Publicly pointing out that a person is doing something oppressive is one way to describe calling out. And we have probably dealt with calling out, maybe been the recipient of it or delivering it or just witnessed it in our experiences. Calling in, on the other hand, is a very different practice, a deliberately compassionate practice of pulling folks back in who have strayed from the group. Another way to think about it is loving each other enough to allow each other to make mistakes. So starting from the assumption or sort of belief that we're in community together and that people mean to do well and mean to learn, but do not always um, transmit their ideas respectfully or sensitively and need help doing that. So I want to emphasize, well, let me ask you all, why would we want to call in instead of call out? Feel free to share in the chat or over video. Why why try calling in as a classroom strategy? Uh, 
I think it's more palatable for the person who's experiencing the correction. And because it's more palatable, they're more likely to uh, potentially adjust their behavior, especially if they don't mean to be, um, I mean, it's because the idea that you're talking about is they're making mistakes. In other words, it's not necessarily intentional on their part. Right. It's it's a potential learning opportunity for the student. Right. And Lucy points out to reinforce or restore norms of the teaching space. So right to um, to model our values with our students. Right. To intervene on these moments. But also, as you were pointing out, to sort of uh, reinforce the culture that we want in our class. Oh yeah. And we're trying to learn, right. When individuals are in a defensive space, they tend to shut down. Exactly. And like Mary said, right. Um, it could be a really good opportunity to redirect the student towards more positive behavior or more sensitive sort of framing. And it could really exacerbate the issue, right. If the student feels put on the spot, right. It doesn't feel good. Even if they didn't, you know, mean to, do something hurtful. I want to credit um, that uh, women of color feminist work has a lot of, um, is really the foundation of calling in as a concept. And I've linked two authors here who I really like with really accessible pieces about the importance of calling in and its sort of social impact. And I've linked those at the end of the presentation as well. I want to also emphasize that calling in is not always going to be the best solution. And sometimes you are going to need calling out. But my suggestion is to start with calling in, to try calling in and offering people an invitation to improve their behavior before resorting to calling out. And we'll also talk about when we make that decision between the two. So a little reminder here, something I hear all the time is folks say, well, I'm not an expert in that. I'm not an expert in identity or oppression or racism or classism. How can I correct a student about it? And I want to tell you, you do not have to be an expert, right? And Mac and I do this work 24 seven, but we don't have every identity. So we don't know every identity's experience. So there's two things we can do instead, if we don't feel like we can speak from our own experience to intervene. One thing we can do is honor lived experience. So emphasize what folks have told us about being marginalized and say, you know, let's say, for example, I am not, I am, but I am not mixed race. I don't know what it's like to be a mixed race. But if we listen to what this group has told us, then we know that this action or this statement is hurtful. For example, maybe I don't identify as trans, but I say, but if we listen to what trans folks have been telling us and sharing about their experiences, then we know that this is a hurtful practice. Another thing we can do is utilize empathy. So you don't have to have the identity in question, but you can encourage students to think about it from an empathetic perspective. So maybe you might say, you know, I am not a lesbian, but I think if I was, I would be incredibly hurt by that statement. Or I think that would feel very delegitimizing or dehumanizing to me if I was in that position. So encouraging students to think empathetically about who they're talking about. The other question I want to highlight is that, um, Something that, that, that we get asked is, what if the person who's the target or the people who are the target of the statement are not present? So let's say you have a class of all men students and uh, there's no women in the class and uh, someone says a misogynistic statement. Does it matter that the uh, woman is not there to hear it? And does it matter? Should you intervene? What do you all think? Let's share our thoughts in the chat. Moya says, absolutely. You know, think, share what they're thinking about whether to enter, like why they would intervene or why they wouldn't. I'll, I'll go. I was I started typing, but it was too much. <laughs> go for um, it. But I think it's important to, in this case, I would intervene because it's important to try to challenge and 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 
change perspectives on how you see things and how you view things and, and the person or community or whomever might not be present in that moment but when you interact in another capacity then um you'll have this in the in on your forefront that you 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 heard this and you got a different per perspective on it i think that's beautifully said um the behavior or the statement is still a problem it is still hurtful it can still hurt other people so we do want to intervene on it something else i want to point out is we don't actually know the gender makeup of our class do we just by looking at them right so we don't actually know who has what identity in our classroom unless they've all explicitly told us and then you know we would have to believe that they all told us exactly what they're experiencing but we shouldn't have to know that to know that it's to decide to intervene on a moment like that so Keeping in mind, we don't always know the identities of our folks who are present, people of complex identities that we can't tell by looking at them, and the behavior is still wrong. We're not just intervening for the student who's targeted, we're intervening to correct the student who makes the harmful statement so that they will make it less in the future. So this is a framework from the Columbia Teaching Center. It's called Hot Moments, and it's three different types of sort of conflict or challenging moments that we might have with our students when dealing with these sorts of statements. We have H, O, and T, so we'll go through them first, is heated. Moments where it's clear something has gone wrong. It's characterized by accusations, name calling, or yelling. So an incredibly heated moment where um, people seem very upset. Um, they're sort of just sort of slinging statements at one another, right? A sort of eruption. Then we have offensive moments where someone has said something offensive, for example, racist, an ignorant joke, et cetera. Um, it may or may not be acknowledged and it could be escalate into a space of being heated. Um, but that is a moment where we might need a different strategy than if we were intervening on a heated moment. And then we have tense moments where the room goes silent, but we've all been here or students are uncomfortable and it can be harder to identify than offensive or heated since we might have a good idea of what it looks like when, you know, things get really, you know, explosive or when someone says something that we can clearly tell is a problem, but a tense moment where everything just kind of gets very awkward and still, and maybe everyone's waiting for something to happen. So these are three different types of moments which means we want to think about different interventions for each of them, because we probably wouldn't intervene on a heated moment the same way we would on a tense moment. Uh, Mac, is there anything you would add here? All right, excellent. So I'm gonna ask us to reflect on hot moments in a second in our own experiences, but um, first I wanna ask us to think about how we decide whether we wanna call in, call out, how we want to respond. A student has, has, how can we tell if a student has made an earnest mistake or is trying to provoke a reaction, which is going to happen every now and then there are going to be students who do want to just say something to be hurtful or to provoke a reaction. So I'm going to ask you all, what factors should we consider when we're deciding how to respond? What comes to mind for you? Mm, Wendy says the context of the conversation. Totally. Oh, these are great answers. The tone of how they said it. That's a really good point, Josh. Yeah. The same words can sound really different with different phrasing, right? History of past behavior. Totally, Mary. We want to keep that in mind. Look at the impact, not just the intention. That's really well said. Your feelings. Yeah. Your feelings in that moment. Absolutely. These are great. Um, we can look at some of the factors that we have isolated here in addition to what you all have shared. So it's things like the course sequence or level. So these, this might not be a checklist you go through, but it's things that might come into your head as you're considering, right? Or preparing for a discussion. Um, where are you, they, the students at in their academic journey? Are they all new? Are they all, are you teaching a grad class? That might change how you intervene on that moment. 
There's also student identity and instructor identity. And this is, can be really complex, right, with our intersectional identities. And like I said, we don't know what students are bringing with them, but it's important to keep in mind how the student like identifies, how you identify, and how that could impact the statement that's being made. Patterns of behavior, which someone brought up, Mary brought up in the chat, absolutely. So if a student says something that is hurtful and it's the first time they've made a comment like that and they've always been really compassionate in their responses, you probably will, will respond differently than a student who every class session starts to fight with their neighbors in class about something, right? Um, discipline and topic. Some classes, it's going to be more okay to explore identity issues because um, there are norms set about it and others, it may not be as acceptable. Lesson focus, what the content of the class is, what you're talking about, what disciplinary tools you're using, the size of the class that you have, and then the timing of the comment, beginning or end of the semester. So maybe a student says something hurtful right at the beginning of the semester, um, and they, you may treat that really differently from a student who has been with you all semester and then says something hurtful. So these are some factors for you to keep in mind. Again, it's not a hard and fast checklist, but some things that you wanna consider as you plan for your class and as you in the moment when you do deal with a hot moment. So I'm going to ask us to do a free write now. Um, so we're going to ask you to respond to the following questions on your own. So piece of paper, computer, whatever you like. We're not going to ask you to share your responses in the chat, but you are welcome to if you would like. And our questions are, have you encountered hot moments, heated offensive tense? Um, how might your response change in a heated versus offensive versus tense moment? And what have you done well when responding to these moments in the past? And what might you change in the future? So uh, how long do we want to give folks for this free write? About three minutes. Sounds good. Let's do three minutes. Let's take one more minute to reflect. And if you do want to... Um, share in the chat as you wrap up please feel free and other than that i think we will move on does that sound right back all right all right folks um so hopefully that uh prompted you to think a little bit um and hopefully you can keep that uh those thoughts in mind as we go through kind of this next section which will really focus in on strategies so how do you do this how do you do calling in? What are some ways that you can actually approach uh, approach calling in? So luckily, the title of my slide is how do we approach these conversations? Um, so what we suggest is as you approach these conversations and you speak with your students about uh, discussion, discussion techniques, um, that you emphasize curiosity, exploration, listening, reflection, dialogue, uh, understanding and respect rather than agreement or expertise. So we want our students to un recognize, understand, and value different perspectives. And while they may not necessarily agree with their peers, so we're not focusing on that agreement here, sometimes and many times there likely isn't really a right answer. So helping them appreciate those different viewpoints can be more valuable than agreeing on what the correct, and I'm using air quotes there, correct response is. So we promote understanding over resolution, um, recognizing that folks uh, in your class and students can occupy multiple perspectives on that same issue. So they may see different viewpoints. We want to encourage them to see those different viewpoints. Um, we also want to encourage empathy, uh, both for our students and for ourselves. And then also recognizing that we may have some disciplinary skills or scholarly practices that we can fall back on, depending on what your, uh, of course, what your discipline is um, to help you guide some of these conversations. So to get into some of the nitty gritty here, Again, we are going to be presenting a lot of strategies, uh, and you certainly cannot apply all of them in every single class. So feel free to take out those ones that are really most useful to you. Um, and I meant to say this at the beginning, but we do share all of our slides and resources afterwards. So don't feel like you need to take uh, really detailed notes. You will get the slides with all of the, the information on them. Okay. 
So before you even start these conversations, before you have a conversation in class, really, and I would say any discussion, um, it can be really helpful to develop goals for that discussion. So what do you want students to get out of the conversation? What are your goals for a student discussion on one of these topics? Um, like we mentioned, it can also be really helpful to co-create classroom norms or guidelines. You can see those uh, that first slide that we or the the guideline slide that we had uh, that shares some of the guidelines that we tend to see as being important for our workshops, and you may find similar guidelines helpful for your classrooms. Um, you can include a syllabus statement on respectful dialogue, and we have some sample syllabus statements on the next slide. Um, you want to make sure you make boundaries clear. So what happens when students leave the boundaries of appropriate behavior and how do we address that? How do you communicate to students what those boundaries are? And again, these likely will be different for each uh, instructor, each classroom, each classroom uh, setting. So as, uh, as the instructor and hopefully or potentially in collaboration with your students, you can work on developing those boundaries together. And then we also always like to say, plan for those challenging comments. So what could go wrong? What about your topic could students say that is challenging or perhaps maybe ignorant, maybe coming from a space of just not knowing as much about the topic and not knowing how to discuss it? So what might they say and what might you do uh, if something like that comes up? Hopefully nothing, uh, no challenging comments will occur. But we find that it's better to prepare and not have to use our preparation than it is to not be prepared and be kind of caught off guard in that moment. So what are some of the sample syllabus statements? And here we're going to have two. Um, one, I believe, is from Shed's, one of Shed's classes. Um, so Shed teaches sociology, so has a lot of these conversations about gender um, that or has a lot of conversations that could turn into some a place where a challenging comment occurs. Um, so their syllabus statement was, this course is heavily reliant on dialogues between and among classroom members. Occasionally, we'll be dealing with controversial topics about which individuals may have strong and differing opinions. Therefore, it's crucial that we work together to cultivate a classroom space in which everyone can share their reactions and analysis comfortably. This means being considerate and patient with everyone else in the room. Verbal bullying and personal attacks will not be tolerated under any circumstances. So Shit has set some boundaries here some things that are okay, some things that not, are not okay, and is describing to students how they should uh, participate and uh, engage in the class. Similarly, my background is in STEM. I typically teach classes about viruses and biology. Um, so my respectful syllabus statement is, uh, as the scientific background of those in the course is varied, please be respectful of different knowledge levels. All students, regardless of perceived knowledge in science, um, are encouraged to participate and voice their thoughts and opinions. Some of the topics that we discuss may be controversial and opinions on all sides are welcome, but they need to be supported by reputable sources and facts. Please be respectful of those with different opinions from yours. So it's a similar type of vibe, a similar type of, um, let's say, general message that we're trying to get across, but the way that we communicated that is slightly different given the course context and the background of our students. Um, so for me in the STEM field, it was really important that we weren't getting into any sort of conspiracy theories or any sort of topics that that aren't really supported by the science uh, by the scientific community. And I showed students how to make sure that any of the information that they were sharing in class was supported by reputable sources. So it was really important that we show and we teach students how to use these guidelines. And similarly, in uh, speaking about uh, you know trying to be considerate and patient with. Uh, with folks, you can also show them what that looks like in the classroom. So now let's get into the, so what happens when something happens? So something happens in your class, uh, what do you do? So a challenging comment is made and you have a, lots of different options again, so we'll go through lots of different options um, and hopefully you'll be able to find some that are useful to you. So we're going to start with the pause here. So what's important to note about the pause is that you don't have to have a thought out response to every challenging uh, comment as soon as it occurs. So I recognize some of your all's names from uh, a great workshop this morning on incorporating um, current events into your teaching practice. So that was run by uh, Felton Moss and Brian McGowan. Um, and something that came up was that it's really important to take care of yourself in these moments. Um, these comments by their nature are really difficult to discuss and address. So depending on that nature of the comment and your own identities, these can be really hurtful to you. It's not just the students that these comments can be hurtful to. 
So as you hear these strategies, what I really encourage you to do is to keep in mind things that would feel comfortable for you as the instructor, so that you set those boundaries as to what is acceptable and what isn't, um, and keeping your own health and well-being in mind uh, so that you can prioritize your own mental health. So how do you how do you implement the pause, right? So immediate aftermath of a comment um, and the pause can help you determine if you'd like to address something and if so, how and when. So one thing to do, just the, a quick, easy thing to do is to take a couple breaths or take a sip of water. You'll see us doing that um, a lot, not because someone's made a challenging comment, but so that we wait enough time for people to respond. Um, you can also potentially give the entire class a break and then return together to discuss or you could give the class a break and decide not to discuss it that day. It is completely reasonable to say, we are not prepared to have this conversation or address this comment right now, and we will address it in the, in the following class session. But it is important to acknowledge and actually return to that conversation once you're, you and your students are more prepared there. Another strategy that you can use is asking for clarification or trying to redirect a student's response. So some of the ways that you can ask for clarification are just simply by asking, what do you mean? Or saying, how do you see what you said connecting to a particular topic? So that kind of brings them back to the goals of the discussion for that day. You can also uh, prompt them to remember that we've set classroom guidelines or norms by saying, keeping this classroom guideline in mind, could you tell me more about that? Um, you can also repeat back to folks what they say. Uh, sometimes when people are speaking, they don't realize exactly what they said or how it was taken. Um, so this strategy can really offer them a chance for self-correction. So you paraphrase a comment and you say, is this what you meant? Um, and hopefully you got what they meant, and then you can work through to address any misconceptions there. You can prompt the speaker to reflect by asking what might you think that a particular group would say about that. So similarly, re relying on that um, lived experience that Shed mentioned earlier in the workshop. You can also say things like, I understand what you're saying, but I'm thinking about how this particular group might find that hurtful. So you may not have those identities, but again, relying on other people's experiences um, and how you think they might feel. And then finally, uh, to help with some of the clarification and redirection, you can also help just with rewording. So I think I might know what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, or I would encourage you to use other words and then mention those other words that they should, that they should use. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Shed, and Shed's going to share their screen because we got a lot of animations on these slides um, to talk about context, uh, utilizing context to address uh, challenging comments. All right. Um, give me one second to start our presentation up. And it took me right to the beginning. So here we go. All right. I actually think I went too far. Here we go. All right, let's talk about strategies for during uh, when something has happened to add to what Mac has shared. And let's think about context. Um, so let's, so we want to focus on ideas, not individuals as much as possible. So rather than saying something like, you know, um, <laughs> you, <laughs> you did this thing wrong, you know, this person was wrong, that person did this thing to try and focus on the ideas that the person is sharing. So maybe our, <laughs> our, a uh, reflexive response is to say, uh, we don't have a Jeff, do we? That's always my go-to name. I say, last class, Jeff really messed it up, everyone. Jeff really tanked it, you know? Instead, we might want to generalize to the group and ask everyone to uh, keep this in mind. Last class, here's an example. Last class, the word handicap came up during our discussion, and I want us to address why we want to use other wording. So in this situation, uh, a student might mean well, but they have used the term someone or maybe multiple someone's used the word handicap. And we want to ask them to reflect on that instead of saying, hey, you, you know, step out with me. You are the one who did something wrong. It might be multiple students in the class who were using that term. Um, and we want to offer all of them an opportunity to learn about it. Another thing we wanna do when it comes to context is consider the context of the statement or comment. 
So does the comment seem well intentioned? What is the person trying to say with their comment? Are they trying to empathize, but maybe the language is a little um, hurtful unintentionally? Are they trying to say delegitimize de a group of people? That really changes, right? How we respond. Is the student using inflammatory language? And another thing to keep in mind is if you offer these opportunities and the student doesn't take it, well, they don't stop using the inflammatory language after you ask them not to, then that's going to affect the response. As we mentioned earlier, we want to consider previous patterns of a student's behavior. Sorry about that. Um, to give my own sort of context on this, I had a student who made a very transphobic comment in class once. And if maybe he had, well, this is tough because it's never acceptable to say something like that. But even though his classmates tried to call him in and I tried to call him in and folks offered him more thoughtful and less hurtful ways of phrasing things, he did not improve, right? He kept going on with what he was saying, using hurtful language, inflammatory language. And something to keep in mind was, this was not the first time that this had happened with this student of making disruptive comments. At that point, I knew that I had to remove that person from the class. So it's important to keep in mind how a student has been expressing themselves in class up until that point, because that can sway how you respond. And in a moment where maybe you decide not to use a, um, maybe you decide not to intervene, um, you know, and, and to one person or two people, you focus on the group and you say, let's just remember to keep our norms in mind. Let's remember to keep uh, transparent communication in mind. Uh, let's keep our community guidelines in mind, right? So just reminding students in a moment um, to carry on the respectful practice because it's not just something you want them to do. It's a scholarly expectation for the class. And it's part of what they're expected to do in any discipline is be respectful like that. And so it's part of their performance in the course to practice the respectful norms you've created. Another thing that we want to point out is as much as you can avoid letting these moments become a one on one or a teacher versus student interaction that might be what some students want is to sort of get into an argument. Um, or maybe the student doesn't mean it at all, but we get caught up in the moment. We want to avoid that because it totally undercuts our authority as instructors and turns it into a sort of one-on-one -on -one back and forth fight, right? And instead, we want to focus on community learning and saying, we should be careful about using certain terms. Again, we don't know, maybe one student said it, but that doesn't mean other students weren't thinking that harmful thing. And so saying we should be careful, right? Not just, hey, you should be careful. Can we try to be more careful with our words around this issue? So posing it as an invitation to our students, like opting in, like Mac mentioned earlier, can we try to be more careful? Referring to your community agreements that you have prepared with students. So saying something like speaking like this breaks our discussion agreement. And so this is a more escalated strategy here, right? Um, so referring to the guidelines that the class has agreed on about respectful practice and thinking about it, not in terms of they've made, they've broken a rule that you set and maybe they've hurt you and maybe they did hurt you. But in addition to that, they have done a disservice to the class, right? It is, it can impact their um, peers negatively. So framing it as a group effort and an accountability uh, thing. We're asking them to take accountability to their classmates. So yes, maybe the comment did upset me as the instructor, but it is also hurtful to your classmates. I think you should consider how your words impact your classmates because they're here too, right? and reminding students of who is present. So I feel like this comes up a lot in teaching. Um, we may speak about a subject and forget that people who experienced it are in the room. So I've taught about sex trafficking um, some, and often I notice that folks will talk about it, like people who experience sex trafficking are, are all on it, conveniently on another planet, you know? But the truth is we know people who have been through this, and you may have one or two or more students who have dealt with some aspect of sex trafficking or a similar type of violence. So we don't want to assume, you know, if we say we to the class, 
try not to assume what everyone's experiences are and try not to uh, act as though a particular group is um, not part of the conversation. Let's remember that we don't know what people are bringing with them to class because we really don't. And so we don't want to speak as though um, uh, we don't share a certain identity. You know, we're all part of this group, not another group. And if appropriate, turn the tish, turn the issue over to the class. Now, this one can be sort of another one where you have to think carefully about when you want to apply this. If a student has sort of been on a roll of making hurtful comments, it may not be the right time to turn it over to the class. Or if you're nervous that it will bloom into a conflict or a, you know a, a heated moment, it will not be appropriate to turn the issue over to the class. But if it is a moment where you feel that a peer can call them in, that will be as powerful, if not more powerful, than you calling in the student because peers learn best from one another, right? So you may ask the class, you might say, okay, that's one perspective. I'm hearing you. What are our thoughts? Does anyone else want to share their, their perspective? And often in my experience, another student does share a perspective that helps the student sort of see why what they said could be hurtful. And that's, like I said, really impactful versus me just saying, here's why I think that's wrong, <laughs> right? And keeping in mind our community agreement. So prompting students to remember the respectful guidelines before they speak or respond to this. All right. So this is sort of our escalated sort of um, situation. What do we do when we get to a point where there is a lot of hurt and insult and calling in hasn't worked? We're gonna give an example here of what it means to communicate hurt and insult because that may be what you have to do at a certain point with students. Um, so maybe, uh, actually I'll ask us to look at the no first because this might be what we're tempted to say in a moment like this. So a student maybe says an ableist comment and part of us maybe wants to say, so you're saying you hate disabled people and you don't want us on AU's campus, right? Um, now, what we want to do in the learning moment to take advantage of the opportunity for student growth would be something like the yes statement. I was hurt when you said that we should not prioritize access for disabled people on AU's campus. Everyone has a right to get into the buildings on campus, and we should not gatekeep access, knowledge, and connections for disabled people simply because they cannot walk or get inside a building. So in this response, the person has, uh, the, the imagined instructor here, has explained the hurt they feel, why they feel it, and sort of giving their perspective on the issue, right? How dehumanizing that response, that statement felt to them and why it was dehumanizing. And this might be a solution, right? This might be how you call a student in if they have not adapted their behavior with your previous attempts. Some other examples, a uh, sort of sentence stem here would be, I was hurt when you said blank because blank, I statements. So using I statements to clearly explain what you're feeling or what you, the feeling that you think is per, pervading the classroom um, and explaining why it's hurtful and inconsiderate. So the student can learn about, you know, why they, why we're asking them to stop that behavior. And if all else fails, ask someone to leave class. Now I feel, no, this feels probably pretty radical. <laughs> um, and I want you to know that it does not happen as often as you might worry. I know this is a constant fear for a lot of instructors. It's having to ask someone to leave class, but I do want you to know that uh, in most instructors I know have never had to do it. I did have to do it, but I do also teach on social identity issues. So it's not that surprising for me. Um, but something I would ask you to think about is where do you draw that line for yourself um, for when you would ask a student to leave class? And as Mac mentioned earlier, how can we make that as transparent as possible for our students about the parameters of appropriate behavior so they know how to stay inside them? And they're aware when they do leave them of what happened. So just to um, put, boil everything down, actually, to like, um, that's seven words, or no, eight. Um, disagreement is not wrong. Making hurtful comments is. Being disrespectful is. 
students can disagree as much as they would like, and it can be an important part of learning and growing with one another, but they must do it respectfully and following community guidelines. So a student, you might totally disagree with what they're saying, but they need to present it respectfully. And if they don't, then it doesn't matter what belief they're sharing. Even if they're shouting about how they agree with me about something, if they're being disrespectful, it's still not appropriate. And let's talk about the after. So we want to reflect after a moment like this happens. So for example, sending a message to your students to engage them asynchronously and reflecting on that moment that happened in class, that hot moment. You may have a one-to-one -one meeting with the student or students who may have um, who may have uh, incited or like said the hurtful uh, statements to debrief what happened, why did it happen, how can we keep it from happening in the future. And you may start class, the next class, with a reflective pause. Uh, what could have been different about this session, about that session where we had the hot moment? How will the class proceed in this in future discussions? You may even update your community agreements to reflect what you've learned. So consider reviewing or adapting the class contract. And we want to encourage you to do your own self-reflection. So if you do get called in, we are going to ask you to accept responsibility if it's needed, if it's appropriate, um, and ask yourself, did you say or do something that contributed to or caused the discomfort? How do you rebuild connections with students? It's okay to acknowledge that you should have addressed a comment. I get this question all the time. Uh, you know, someone said something a week ago, a month ago, however long ago. Can I still say something about it? Yes. Or maybe I said something hurtful. Can I still correct it? Yes. It's such a great example for your students. Open yourself into open yourself to being called in by students by opening up some uh, pathways for them to communicate with you and share feedback and suggestions and reflect on the discussion that you had. What went well, what didn't go well, could different preparation have changed it? And what would you change for future discussions? Um, sorry, I'm <laughs> um, keeping track of my slides here. Um, I wanna remind you all, this is really about proactive action, which is a total redundant thing to say. It's all proactive, right? The earlier, the better. We are going to have to react but the more preparation we do, the easier it is and the less moments we have to react to. The earlier, the better. Work on those community norms, establish communication pathways with students, explain to them how you expect them to communicate with like etiquette wise with language or terms. Practice, it's not easy to say these things. It's not easy to call people in. It's easier when you practice and document everything. Please, for me, document everything. Document, you know, CC a supervisor. If you have a meeting with a student about a moment like this, email them a summary after maybe BCC or CC a supervisor, or just let them know that you had the conversation so that you have documentation of this work that you've done. So now what we're going to ask you to do is to uh, reflect on, uh, collaborate with your colleagues in breakout rooms and reflect on a case study, a calling in case study, and ask you to think about how you would respond. And we have a Google Doc that goes with that. So we're gonna ask you to take 10 minutes to read through the case study that we're providing. You're all good, Mary, thank you. Um, and the document uh, Mac has helpfully put in the chat. And while you're in breakout rooms, we're just asking you to look at that document, consider the case study, and then when we come back, we'll do a quick debrief of what you discussed. Anything else, Mac? Excellent. All right. So let's go into breakout rooms. And just as a note, as you're seeing, uh, lots of folks have to leave. Um, so we may need to scooch people around just in case. Um, so please be aware, uh, we would really love if you would stay for the breakout rooms, but we understand you have other obligations. Stephanie, are you able to join your breakout room? Oh. Oh, I see. <laughs> like... Okay. 
Stephanie, let us know if you're having issues uh, accessing your breakout room. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, I just, I joined really late. Like I literally only caught the last five minutes. So I just wanted to give respect to the people that were here and I'm gonna just listen in. Yeah, that's totally fair. You, you are completely welcome to join the conversation if you'd like to, but you're, it's also totally fair um, for you to stay in this main room. Uh, so we understand that. You just will hear a little bit of the back channel chat that, that Shed and I are oh. gonna have. Yeah, that's fine. No worries. Okay, great. All right. So they'll be out it. of the rooms. That's yeah. okay. Um, probably two, what, eight minutes from now? Okay. I can't do math. What's that? 303? <laughs> On me. Um, so then I think we could do, I mean, they, they don't seem super chatty so it might be okay to just have like a five or so minute debrief um yeah but I, th I think we're totally we're totally solid on time since we took everybody um hopefully you had some fruitful conversations in your uh in your breakout rooms um so what we'd like to do now is just kind of get a get a little debrief going of what you what you took out of your conversation what are some of the takeaways you got maybe you learned something new from one of your colleagues or even just summarizing your conversation. I think regardless of what you share, um, other various folks will be very, uh, will find it very valuable. And you can feel free to raise your hand or um, put it in the chat, whatever works best for you. I'll first of all say thank you for offering a really rich example that uh, connected to experiences of I've had in the classroom um, and the opportunity to chat with colleagues about it. Um, and just one takeaway that I had is again just a reminder of the value of pausing and um, in previous situations. I have felt rushed to jump in and say something. And so I would I would like to think in future situations, I would pause and ask the student to clarify what they meant. And that can buy me some time to let an emotion evoked kind of move through me and be prepared to respond. Thank you so much for sharing that, Moya. I think a lot of times it feels really urgent in that moment. Like you need to say something, something bad happened. Like I gotta say something right now, or everything will will <laughs> will end and will will go to go to crap. Um, but that's really not the case, right? So sometimes that that pause is helpful for you to address your own um, to address anything that came up that you may need to to kind of like just process. I think. Um, and also to give your students a second to pause and say, oh, well, was that, what did that person actually say? Ugh, I don't know. And get some of those uh, emotion, those initial kind of really strong emotions. Uh, I don't want to say managed, but kind of like process so that you can then help your students uh, pull out those positive connections. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and then we have Donna sharing in the chat um, that Nalco and Josh and her were in a room. Um, Josh said that the tone of the question matters a lot, and that was agreed upon. Um, and then their discussion centered on how to gently bring in uh, other voices to answer what may have been a really honest question, rather than a, those people, in air quotes again, uh, type of comment. So thank you, Donna. I really, I, I appreciate that reflection. And I think that's really valuable that, uh, unfortunately, sometimes in these situations, you have to wait until you hear it being said, because if it's said in a why don't those people move away kind of tone that may prompt a different re uh, reaction than, you know, why, why don't those people move away? So that, that tone can be something that you rely on. Um, and if you can't tell via tone, you can always try to pull out those positive intentions or ask your students to clarify, because maybe their tone wasn't what they intended it to be. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Donna. I really especially like that idea of gently bring the other voices in because 
right? It could have been that honest question. So if Aziza said, well, why don't those people just move away, right? And maybe Aziza means well, and maybe has always, you know, like maybe they're reliably a student who um, gives really empathetic responses or, or maybe not. Um, but what I really appreciate is that idea of um, transitioning into a learning opportunity with that. And you don't have to agree with the student to acknowledge their comment. So you can say, you know, I understand, I understand what you're saying. So let's, let's ask why, why don't people move away from those spots? And maybe at the end, that might be a good opportunity to say, so maybe now we can kind of see why it's not as easy as, as, as maybe it seems, you know, letting the student sort of, because I would bet another student would say, well, I can, you know, I, I have an idea why. Um, so yeah, like almost sometimes treating it as a genuine transition into a learning moment, if the student is receptive to it, I think can be really great. See you unmuted, Josh. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I was just thinking um, that there's almost like this guiding idea here that that you could think about, which is sort of assume good intent until someone shows you that they don't have good intent. Yeah. I think you put it perfectly. Absolutely. And and like I said, you know, some you have to make some decisions in the moment about how to respond, um, about what the person means. But I think that's why it's important to give them some opportunities. If you are worried that giving them the opportunity to improve will allow them to share more hurtful comments, that's, you know, when we might say, you know, let's, let's pause this, you know. And Donna shared, Mary Gray brings up a similar experience frequently when she was having students research requirements to show ID when voting, her students would make comments like, well, everyone has an ID, which maybe when you are 18 is a uh, logical, <laughs> you know, you go, well, you know, everyone where I lived <laughs> had, an, had an ID. And a, a similar one I hear is people saying things like, we're all citizens, um, but we're not. Yeah, <laughs> see your face, which is well intended, right? People are trying to find a way to generalize the group in, in a community sense, but we're not all citizens um, for different reasons. So, so yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, that's a that's a great example. Any other thoughts that people would like to share? Doing my own pause <laughs> at the water bottle. Um, all right. Well, thank you all so much. I think this was uh, this was really valuable, and I'm glad that you all. Uh, stuck it out to, to join in those breakout rooms. Um, what we just wanna do real quickly right now is uh, share just two final slides and I can do that um, once I start my presentation. Um, yeah. So what we just wanna do is offer you some institutional resources. So in the event that something happens and you feel like you need additional support, um, know that you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of resources that you can use. So the Office of the Dean of Students is a place that you can reach out to, and they run some of these uh, things that we're going to mention. So the Office of Student Accountability and Restorative Practices, which used to be something like the Office of Conflict Management, uh, something along those lines. The, this is an office that uses restorative justice and restorative uh, lenses to address some, uh, when something goes wrong in a learning environment. And so they offer this uh, process called learning environment restoration, where they work with you as an instructor and a student to try and re, um, well, to try and restore the learning environment and make it so that you can still have a really productive conversation and really productive class throughout the, um, throughout the rest of the semester, if this happens you know, at a, earlier in the semester, such that you can um, address it like this. Um, these I would I would suggest these are more for those instances where a student is kind of resisting being called in, and you may need uh, that extra institutional support or that extra institutional kind of push there. Um, uh, OSARP, which is what they're called, the Student Accountability Office, um, also offers consultations, so you can also reach out to them for consultations. Um, some of you know. Uh, the teaching and learning team also does consultations, so we would always be happy to, dis to discuss any comments with you um, or kind of how to address them if you need assistance there. And then finally, um, if there is an instance where you might need to uh, um, uh, 
submit, there's the word, <laughs> submit a care report that is a system that the university has in place. This is just a, a way to notify a student's advisor um, and get it on, and that student that you think something, you know, they could use a little bit of additional support or assistance and that care report system can help, uh, help them achieve that extra assistance. So our final reflection, um, feel free to just kind of take this question with you as you go throughout your, uh, throughout your day. You don't have to answer it right now, but just kind of reflect on it. So as your final reflection, how might you introduce calling into your students as a classroom practice? How might you introduce that this is the way that you're going to address some of these challenging comments? And how do you communicate that with your students? And I encourage you to take that with you as you go throughout the rest of your day and kind of think about that um, in the case that you would like to use the strategy in your, in your classroom. So with that, we thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really enjoy this, this conversation. Um, we love working with instructors and getting to, to hear your your thoughts and your your perspectives on various issues. You always bring up new things and we always learn stuff when we work with you all. So we really appreciate it. Um, and I think that Nausea is about to or already has uh, dropped an evaluation link into um, the uh, chat. Um, so feel free. Uh, we would love if you would uh, if you could fill that out. We, we do actually use and read those evaluations and that feedback um, to help us inform the rest of our programming.